Hey, what's up there, YouTubers? It's me again, Brian, aka Gamer55551. And I am back with a My Choose Set Nintendo slash Gaming video for this week, for the week of January 27th to the um, 23rd and all. Uh, before we get started, I do want to say that there won't be any video game review for. Um, this week, though, a couple things kind of come up that I have to kind of address and all that stuff. So, unfortunately, I'm not going to have the time um, this week, though. I'll try to do one next week, but for right now, where things are at the moment, I have this is something I have to address, though. So, hopefully, it can be resolved and I will be able to have a video review for you um, next week and all that stuff. But in the meantime, we got five stories to cover for this week, including the Resident Evil showcase that happened um, this week. Um, some Unfortunately, more fallout uh, with Cyberpunk 2077, this time with the demo that was shown that may have not been the real demo and all that stuff. An interesting and surprise announcement of THQ porting a game over to the Nintendo Switch. My response to an article on the New York Times about video games and all that stuff. And the, cre and the former creator of, the former head of Valhalla Studio um, wanted, wanted to get back into gaming and all that. But before we get started though, um, we'll do a, a quick one rundown of what is basically the quick my, um, quick um, my two cents story where basically I take a look at some of the stories um, and get my, or um, shall I say more likely, a quick look at some of the stories that didn't really get my attention as much but are still still worth talking about it to a certain degree though the first one i do want to talk about is that the upcoming um square enix game and from the creator of the sonic the hedgehog series balan wonderworld will be giving a demo i believe sometime i believe before the end of this month and all that stuff i'm very curious to see how that game plays and all we know it's coming to the nintendo switch so i definitely will take a look at that i'm definitely i would say getting a bit of a nights into dreams vibe out of it though but i'll but once the demo comes out i'll try i'll take a look at that one see how that one plays um supposedly we learned that capcom's um forecast or their finance wise is doing better than expected and all and some of that has contributed to some of the games they put out including the upcoming or including or at least one of them that certainly has helped at least in, with their forecast to a certain degree is the upcoming release of monster hunter rise and all that stuff which I tried a little bit of that demo though. It's definitely impressive how they got the Resident Evil engine um, running on that game, but we'll have to wait and see when that game um, ultimately does come out and all. We learned that um, Team Ninja has basically squashed any hopes, unfortunately, that there are currently no plans at this time for a new um, Ninja Gaiden game at, th at this moment though. It doesn't mean that they won't do it at some point down the road, but it doesn't seem like we'll be seeing one um, anytime um, soon right now, which is a little bit unfortunate though. The only thing we have right now are the rumors going around that supposedly a Ninja Gaiden trilogy is in the works and that supposedly it will be coming to the Nintendo Switch, but again, that's just a rumor at this time. There's no official confirmation. We also learned that a lot of studios such as basically Sony and Microsoft are pushing for more acquisitions of a lot of, of studios out there, which is certainly isn't surprising considering um, Sony re re you know, purchased a Insomniac game. The big surprise, of course, last year was Microsoft buying Bethesda and all that stuff. And to top it all off, we're now learning that companies like Google and Amazon with, you know, Google Stadia and, Amazon, and the upcoming um, cloud gaming service, Amazon Luna, they're looking into buying um, studios um, as well. So we'll be very curious to see what kind of studios these companies buy. I mean, even with Nintendo too, they recently bought Next Level Games. It'll be interesting if they start jumping in and buying in um, studios and all. We also learned that basically um, there is basically the Nintendo Switch has sort of helped expand the console market to a certain degree that it's also bringing in um, new consumers and all that, which supposedly that is, I think is a good thing. You want to bring in new customers and that stuff. You still want to create it to cater to, you know, your hardcore, your longtime fans and all that stuff, but I don't think there's anything wrong bringing in, like, new customers and all that. Uh, we also learned that one of the games that might be released this year from EA, though, is supposedly um, the up the game 
zo Plants vs. Zombie Battle for um, Neighbor Neighbor Villa. It might get a release date sometime this year. There's supposedly a leaked about about it though. While meanwhile, Apex Legends for the Nintendo Switch may have been accidentally um, leaked too. Again, links will be in the description. You could check it out. I would say um, it's nice that EA's finally bringing some games over, but. I still have my doubts considering this is EA we're talking about and the even when the Switch is doing very well and all that stuff, they come up with excuse after excuse after excuse why they don't want to bring their games over to the Nintendo Switch. Some of that is because they've gone the direction of pushing recurring user spendings and all that stuff. Hell, I think people would like to see The Sims 4 come onto the Nintendo Switch. I think the Dead Space series would be nice, or any, or you know, Mass Effect 1, 2, and 3, or maybe Dragon Age 1, 2, and In Inquisition. I think those would be a good fit to bring over to the Nintendo Switch. But this is EA we're talking about, and given EA's so-called great partnership that they have with Nintendo, though, I'm not really holding my breath on that one. It would be nice, but I'm just just not holding my breath. But we'll see how well Plants vs. Zombie and supposedly Apex Selection, we'll see how well those games do on the Nintendo Switch, assuming the Plants vs. Zombie one is true or not, so we'll have to wait and see. Time will ultimately tell. <clears throat> Okay, uh, now that we're done with the quick might you send part, we'll get started with our first story. And this one has to do with the former creator of Dead or Alive, Ninja Gaiden, and um, Devil's Third, whether you love that game or not, though, is basically looking at basically wanting to make videos again as he formed his own um, studio and that stuff. Now, he... I, I apologize. Unfortunately, I don't know how to pronounce his name correctly, so I apologize for that, though. But most people recognize him for the, the Dead or Alive fighting games, not to mention the Dead or Alive Extreme Volleyball, and the Ninja Gaiden game as well. He also direct, He also produced, also worked at Valhalla Games and basically created Devil's Third, which was kind of controversial to a lot of folks. That some people, some liked it, some thought it did not live up to the expectations that... A lot of people had hope for and all that stuff. He also made some interesting comments about it, um, in a, which can be found on Nintendo Life, about how he basically, basically, basically said that the game's negative reception was down to poor player skills rather than the quality of the game itself, and that Nintendo America had let reviews down, reviewers down by not making it online online mode fully play playable um, prior to release so not everyone so you can you can think he's going overboard you can agree or agree with what he's saying but he not that comment may have not exactly sat very well with everyone nevertheless it looks like he's basically going to get started working on it's working on a brand new studio and wants to get back to working in games though on top of that he has expressed strong interest interest to working with um microsoft again considering that games like ninja guiding and dead or alive at that time was basically found only on you know the xbox and all that stuff but it so in an article in, let me get it out it is, okay so <clears throat> excuse me so in an article in destructoid um it reads that dead or alive creator establishes own studio ikigata I-T-A-G-A-K-I -A -A games. And it's, and it's highlighted, passionate to work alongside Xbox once again. Um, it's, it says, quote, it looks like there's a new gun in town. Charismatic producer Igata, creator of the fighting franchise Dead or Alive, and the head honcho behind the modern Ninja Gaiden title, has announced that he's formed his own studio, Igata Games. The news was revealed in an accepted, in, a, in an expert, from a recent interview between him and Bloomberg, which focused on the 20th anniversary of Xbox. Um, Ikiga Games will exist at his own endeavor and is not connected with the studios such as Ko Koei Techno, Valhalla, or Team Ninja, which, with which Ikiga have been closely associated in the past. Um, in an interview that he posted out also on Facebook, Idiga knows how comfortable he felt when working alongside Microsoft and Xbox in the early 2000s, specifically on the Xbox launch title Dead or Alive 3. In the interview, he ex also expressed pleasure at the possibility of collaborating with the industry um, giant um, once again. He said that, quote, all the main Xbox teams, including um, Berkeley and Fry's and Kevin and their leader, um, Robbie and George, were 
who often play golf with me provided full support on me. Remember Ichigata? I visited Redmond um, once every two months and he introduced me to introduced me uh, a lot of tools and supports that would help speed up game development. If they reach out to me, it will be an honor for me. Left to his own device, it will be interesting to see what Ichigata and his team have in store for the new generation of gaming. Now in the driver's seat, Ichigata fans could see a runner release that stand up again to the producer's past success such as Dead or Alive 4 or Ninja Guy in Black. So fingers crossed lest we forget Devil, the Devil's Third also existed. Which speaking about Devil's Third, um, supposedly according to Nintendo Life, um, he said, according to Nintendo Life, it reads that quote, um, if you're he establishes a new studio, but if you're the one of a few people hoping about a reunite with Nintendo and create Devil Sir 2 for Switch, you might be disappointed. Indie Guys seems key to working with Microsoft and rekindle the relationship, um, relationship which began back in the original Xbox launch. When asked about Xbox fans wanting to see what he does next, he replies, You could count on me for that, otherwise, I wouldn't have accepted. An interview for this Xbox article. I know Microsoft is still aggressive. If, if they reach out to me, it will be an honor for me. Honor me. So it looks as though he's going to get back into you know developing games and all that stuff. Whether or not it's on the same level as Dead or Alive um, or the Ninja Gaiden series, um, that remains to be seen, and time will tell if that happens. But it sounds like if you're hoping for any kind of like a remake of Devil's Third or Devil's Third Two. Uh, that doesn't seem unlikely to happen, and he seems to be, if I'm reading it correctly, more open to the idea of working with Microsoft again. Possibly okay if Microsoft buys the studio or not. I mean, we've seen Microsoft be very aggressive in terms of buying studios, and also considering trying to get into the Japanese market. So, I mean, that could happen in a way and all that stuff. So, we'll have to wait and see. Maybe we'll, maybe he'll produce, we'll see if he produces a really good game and all that stuff. Um, kind of kind of disappointing that we'll probably never get a Devil's Third remake or a Devil's Third 2, though. I didn't think that game was as bad as people made it sound like it is, though. I'll admit it wasn't perfect, but it wasn't as bad as the internet makes it sound like. So, Overall, though, um, very interested to see him get back into gaming, though. He's very key on working with Microsoft again. We'll see if Microsoft opens their door for him or not, or whether or not they choose to buy his studio or not. <clears throat> okay, uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, we'll get to part two. And this one has to do with a response, and somewhat of a response to it, article the New York Times put out in terms of gaming during you know the whole pandemic and COVID-19 and all so we'll take a quick break and we will be right back Okay, and we are back with part two of our My True Scent video. And for this one, I do want to talk about a article that has come out recently from the New York Times. And it basically has to involve the whole issue of video games during the um, pandemic that we are currently facing right now, though. Now, back during the 80s and the 90s as well, video games had been attacked before by a lot of people. Uh, sometimes it was pointed out that games were too violent and all that or like it's rotten in our youth and all that stuff and not to mention we've seen lawyers and politicians have jumped in to even lawsuits against video games companies one good example was after the columbine high school shooting in 1999 several folks filed lawsuits against video games blaming them for the shooting and all that stuff so we've seen situations um like this happen before but we've also seen lately that video games have evolved to a certain degree as we start seeing more and more people play them though and with the whole pandemic and COVID 19 going on going around right now though a lot of people are turning to gaming and yes even streaming streaming services like netflix amazon instant videos hulu disney plus hbo max you know the whole the whole thing right there um have used though as a way to sort of you know play games or something to keep them occupied while while there's recommendation you know to stay at home because of the whole COVID 19 and all that stuff but one article from the new york times um basically um basically kind of came out and sort of pointed out the 
or at least from the people they ask about the whole idea of the dangers of having, you know, playing video games during the pandemic. Some of it is under a paywall if you're able to luck, luck, luckily get it and all that stuff. But it, the title reads that children's screen time has soared in pandemic alarming parents and researchers. Um, there will be a period of epic withdrawal, warned one addiction specialist, one schools, activities, and social life um, return to normal and all that stuff. I won't read the whole article, um, but I'll read um, the sip it, though. Um, read a little bit of the sip it though and it, and if you want to read the article links are in the description though although the new york times one might be behind a paywall i'm not 100 percent sure about that it reads that quote nearly a year into the co coronavirus pandemic parents across the country and the world are watching their children slide down an increasingly sl slippery path in an all-consuming digital life when the outbreak hit many parents relaxed restrictions on screen as a stopgap way to keep frustrated restless children entertained and engaged but often remain limited often remaining limited limits have vaporized as computers tablets phones become the centerpiece of social and social life as weeks of stay-at-home rules been into nearly a um, year um the situation um um situation is alarming parents and scientists a uh, scientist too um some are, it also reads that scientists say that children's brains well through adolescence are considered plastic meaning they can adapt and shift to changing circumstances that could help young people again find satisfaction in an offline world but it becomes harder harder the longer the immune in a rapid fire digital situations uh dr jenny um a pediatrician i was not saying it correctly who studies children use of mobile technology at the university of michigan said she did countless media inter interviews early in the parent area in the pandemic telling parents not to feel guilty of a, of allowing more screen times given the stark challenge of the lockdown now she said she has given a different advice if she had known how long children would end up stuck at home i probably i probably would have encouraged families to turn off wi-fi except during school hours so kids don't feel tempted every moment night and day she added adding the longer they've been doing the the habitat or habitated behavior the harder it's going to break um the habit the concern um Concern is not just over the habits of teens and tweens. Legions of children under 10 are giving countless hours of games like Fortnite um, and apps like Tiki Talk and Snapchat. An app called Roloblox, a pro particularly popular among children ages 9 to 12 in the United States, averaged 31.1 million users a day during the first nine months of 2020 and increased to 82% um, percent over the year before. Um, overall, children seem to children screen time has doubled by May as compared to with the same period in the year prior, according to um, according to Q U S T O D I O, a company that tracks usage of tens of thousands of devices used by children ages four to fifteen worldwide. The data shows that. Usage increase as times passes. In the United States, for instance, children spend on average 97 minutes a day on YouTube in March and April, up to 57 minutes in February, and nearly double in the using a year prior. With similar trends found in Britain and Spain, the company calls the month by month by month increase the COVID effect. Children turn to screens because they say they have no alternatives, activities, or entertainment. This is where they hang out with friends or go to school, all while technology platforms profit by seducing loyal loyalty through tactics like rewards of virtual money or limited edition perks for keeping daily streaks um, um, of use. Um, this has been a gift, um, um, gift to them, which gives them um, a you send them a, 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 a captive audience, our children, um, says this doctor, director of Center of Child Health Behavior and Development at Seattle Children Research Institute. Um, the cost will be borne by families because increased online is is associated with anxiety, depressed, obesity, and aggression, and an addition, an addiction to the medium itself. Now, I do want to say for the record, I, I do want to say for the record though. I've read the New York Times. I don't have a problem reading the New York Times and all that stuff. And I'm not going to pull that media bias or fake news crap or anything um, like that. And I will agree to a certain extent that moderation in terms of playing, you know, video games and all that stuff 
should be sort of be put in place and all that stuff. So I do agree that some form parents should have some form of moderation. All that said, however, I think at the same time though, video games have evolved and changed, as I said before, and more and more people are going into gaming and all that stuff, and especially during these times of lockdown where they're where they don't want you to constantly go out and do all that stuff. I mean, we've seen video games like say Animal Crossing New Horizon, where a lot of people are using that to interact and meet with others. I mean, I've heard stories of one person throwing a birthday party and all that stuff. So, to me, this kind of comes off as sort of a double-edged sword. On one hand, yes, some form of moderation, and it can be a bit addictive if you're not careful. But on the other hand, it can also help, you know, relieve some form of stress and anxiety, especially during these tough times of lockdown. And I do kind of have to agree with some of the criticisms towards this article, especially from sites like Kotaku or Nintendo Life or The Gamer, that this kind of comes off as the same argument we kind of heard back in the 90s, as I mentioned before. You know, the whole, you know, you know, you know the violent video game argument and all that stuff where kids are playing too much video games and so forth so it kind of it's kind of a little bit um i can see a little bit of that argument as well um does the new york times raise some good points though to some degree yes but at the same time it's also worth also worth pointing out that people are playing video games mostly because right now because everything's on lockdown or a lot of places are locked down and all that stuff that it's something to sort of keep them sane and so forth during these um tough times that we're facing so like i said it's a double-edged sword on this one so overall i have to say um i think there are some criticisms i do think the new york times does raise some good, some interesting points but at the same time, there are some criticism towards the article that I don't completely disagree with, such as the fact that they seem to not basically you know, not realize that for a lot of people, playing video games, especially during these tough times, does keep them sane and all that stuff. I don't disagree that there should be some form of moderation and all that stuff, but there is some truth to um, that argument and all that. And I also do agree that they didn't even ask people from the industry themselves, which I can understand that though. And while I don't have a problem reading the New York Times, like I said before, I'm not going to pull that um, media bias or fake news argument. We've seen that card play one too many times and we've seen how far that, uh, about how dangerous that can really go when it goes a bit too far though and all that. So like I said, it's an interesting article, but I will admit I don't exactly 100% agree with what the um new york times or what this person who wrote for the new york times is um saying though again some parts i kind of agree some parts i don't <clears throat> okay uh we're gonna take a quick break and when we get back we'll get to part three and this one has to do with thq announcing that kingdom of amler re-reckoning is coming to the nintendo switch so we'll take a quick break and we will be right back Okay, and we are back with part three of our of my of our my two cent video. And for this one, I do want to talk about the surprise announcement THQ Nordic made, which was that Kingdom of Amler, if I'm saying the name correctly, Re Reckoning is coming to the um, Nintendo Switch. Now, for those who those who may or may not remember, this was a game that was de that was basically developed by 3H Studios that was handled by. Kurt Schilling, if I'm saying his name correctly, a former baseball player, and it involved the state of Rhode Island and all that stuff, and it created a huge controversy over the game not selling well to 3H Studio filed for bankruptcy and all, so it really, the whole thing was just a major controversy on that, though. And it was interesting when we learned how THQ Nordic decided to buy the rights for those games and all that stuff, and last year, they introduced, um, 
Kingdom of Amler Re-Reckoning, sort of an updated version of the original 2011 release with, you know, updated, the visuals updated, running at 60 frames per second, with also basically, um, also with uh, all the DLCs, including a one that's, that they're making that's upcoming for that game as well. And one of the things I, when playing the game, was thinking, and I did a review on this one, I think last year on the PS4, was that this is the type of game I think could, that could fit well on the Nintendo Switch. The ideas of these long or Skyrim-like um, RPGs, I think the Switch would be a mostly an ideal choice to play these type of games, especially, you know, with the whole console handheld concept and all that stuff. Well, it turns out that for those who are hoping for a Nintendo Switch version, we'll be very pleased to hear that THQ Nordic obviously announced Kingdom of Amler re-reckoning um for the nintendo switch uh, according to an article from um destructoid it reads that kingdom of amler re-reckoning is coming to switch with a physical edition in march um it'll cost 40 dollars just like the pc ps4 and xbox one um, the article reads that quote i hope everyone who was holding out for a nintendo switch port of kingdom of amler re-reckoning stays strong and didn't end up getting a different version instead THQ Nordic is bringing Kingdom of Amler Remaster um, to Switch on March 16, 2021. And yes, that includes a $40 uh, physical edition. And just to be clear about that, um, the official Twitter feed of Kingdom of Amler Re-Reckoning um, basically posted a tweet and saying, quote, There will be both a digital and physical edition available for the Nintendo Switch version of Kingdom of Amler Re-Reckoning. The physical edition will have the full game on the cartridge. No downloads are required, which, assuming they stay true to the words, that is a good thing indeed. Uh, believe me, it, 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 that is definitely a good thing. So, anyway, continuing on, the article reads that one of their reviewers wasn't blown away by Re-Reckoning on PS4 last year from a remastered point of view, and they said that I've heard complaints about old and new bugs in the PC version, but he still had a lot of love for this game and noticed a very few mon few modern titles have emerged to marry um, character action and fantasy RPG setting. Though there will un undoubtedly be though they will undoubtedly be technical and performance trade-offs. They usually are, but there's a certain coziness to the idea of revising an action RPG from the Xbox 360 PS3 era on the Switch. Um, looking ahead, THQ Nordic plans to release the new expansion, Fate Warn, um, later this year. We we will, we've seen wild callbacks, uh, comeback stories before, but the whole 3/8 saga and revival of Amler. Omler is up there though. No word about, as far as Fate Warns go, there's no word if that's coming to the Nintendo Switch or not. I assume with this re, assume with Kingdom of Amler re reckoning coming to the Switch, I do assume that there is a good chance it will probably come, that that DLC will probably come to the Nintendo Switch, but again, I, I, it doesn't seem like there's any confirmation at this time and all that stuff. Still, this is definitely pleasant news indeed. I'm very glad that they are bringing this game over to the Nintendo Switch. Like I said before, I think the Switch is a good idea for, you know, like these Skyrim-like um, RPGs. I think the system is a perfect fit for those um, type of games and all that stuff. Now, obviously, there's probably going to be some trade-offs to this, though, which I'm not surprised by it or anything like that, though. Um, obviously, visually, it probably won't look as clean or as pr or as pretty as what the PS4 or the Xbox One or even the PC version, though. But if it's presentable, that is certainly fine, though. I'm hoping they can get the game running at 60 frames per second like the other versions are, but my guess is more than likely it will probably run at 30 frames per second. If that's the case, though, then I do hope that it runs at a steady 30 frames per second despite what exactly is going on on the screen and all that stuff. But still, um, I'm very pleased with this announcement, though. I am definitely looking forward to this game. I definitely will pre-order it. I'm most like more than likely going to get the physical version though that's probably my main thing on that one so overall 
Very happy that THQ Nordic is bringing Kingdom of Amler Re-Reckoning to the Nintendo Switch, though. Here's to hoping that the upcoming DLC does come to the Nintendo Switch, though. I think it is, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, not to mention, I'm also curious to see who's handling the Switch port and all that stuff. And if this game does well, though, on the Switch, though, I do hope that there are plans to do an actual sequel. I would love to see them do a sequel, and if it does, I would love to see that sequel, um come to the um, Nintendo Switch. <clears throat> okay, uh, we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we'll get to part four. And this one has to do with another controversy with Cyberpunk 2077. This time has to do with the demo that was um, showed before the game officially came out. So we'll take a quick break and we will be right back. Okay, and we are back with part four of our My True Scent video. And for this one, we're going to be taking a look at, unfortunately, more and more controversy surrounding Cyberpunk 2077. Now, I'm sure by now you've seen a lot of the controversy surrounding it. Most of it has to do with the PS4 and Xbox One version, as those were basically, were pretty much just broken, buggy, unplayable experience when those games um, originally launched on those systems and all that stuff. And supposedly, you know, CD Projekt Red is working to try to fix a lot of those stuff, um, trying to earn consumers' trust and all that stuff, which I think they have ways to go before they could do that. The only shining spot for at least um, the Cyberpunk 2077 seems to fall on the areas of both the PC, um, Stadia, which may have been, which I think that situation with Cyberpunk 2077 may have helped Stadia to a certain degree, and surprisingly, supposedly the Xbox Series S and all that stuff, given how that runs supposedly at a stable 30 frames per second and all that stuff. Well, it seems as though we are now hearing about more controversy starting to emerge, and this one supposedly falls on the fact that this version we that was shown, the demo version, may have not been, may have been fake and all that stuff. And a lot of this comes from veteran um, game journalists and one who has worked with Kotaku before, or who worked who used to work at Kotaku, Jason Stryer. For those who may not be familiar, he's the one who broke the famous Kotaku story on the whole drama surrounding EA and Bioware's Anthem and all that stuff and the whole issue of crunch and everything like that it, and put really the issue of crunch in the limelight and all that stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, he certainly is back this time working with Bloomberg on the issue situation surrounding Cyberpunk 2077. In an article on Game Rent, I do have a link for the Bloomberg, but I have a, that seems to be behind possibly behind a paywall. It reads that, quote, um, um, there's no denying that despite rave reviews um, for the PC version of Cyber CD Projekt Red's ambitious sci-fi action RPG Cyberpunk 2077 ha has had some something of a disaster launch where players reporting game-breaking bugs and overall per performance issues. Patches and updates have been released with more on the way, but there's still those who feel the game is, is due to some post-release TLC before it felt like a finished game. In a recent piece by Bloomberg's Jason Stryer, it appears that Cyberpunk 2077's trouble began a few years prior to um, E3 2018. An anonymous, as an, uh, as an anonymous employee has stated that the first demo for Cyberpunk 2077 wasn't entirely genius. Before the game was released, journalists and fans were treated to a demonstration of the game ahead of time. While impressed, they were unaware that the footage and gameplay elements were almost entirely fake, though. According to the post, the company has yet to finalize some gameplay elements, so some features such as car ambushes were missing from the final, pro produ final product. Some of the developers for, for, for CD Projekt Red have even said that time spent on the demo was a waste and could have been better used working on the overall game. Others have said that they were pressed by management into working overtime to complete um, Cyberpunk 2020, despite the, head, the CEO stating that this won't be mandatory, though. Um, despite his words, some staff members have reported working more than 13 hours a day with one member quitting. Despite this, the crunch time put in by the developers have arguably 
um, not paid off, with Cyberpunk being delayed a number of times, which led to people sending death threats to the company, though, which I strongly condemn for the record. The game was originally due to come out in April 2020, but was met with a degree of mockery from Eternal developers who began creating memes about the short amount of time they were given to compete it, though. Um, it points out that all that being said, Cyberpunk 2077 is still considered a huge success just below Call of Duty Black Ops, Call, Black Ops Cold War on the NPD's list of top-selling games of December 2020. It was an ambitious project with the game set in a massive city with Keanu Reeves in a prominent role and all done in first-person view, where in the past CD Projekt Red has gone with a third-person view for games like Witcher 3. It's also worth mentioning that the team will be supporting the game throughout with additional patches starting this month and going right through until hopefully gamers will be satisfied that it will be a finished product. Now, supposedly following that following that report from Jason Stryer from Bloomberg though, CD Projekt Red has sort of came out and this one from Game Industry um, Biz uh, basically disputes um, basically the claim about the demo being almost entirely um, um, fake and that one of the CEOs are responding to expose on development troubles behind the sci-fi hit. According to Game Industry Buzz, it reads the head studios of Cyber of Cyberpunk 2077 developer um, CD Projekt Red has disputed claims that an E3 demo for the game was fake. Um, the Adam, one of the C, uh, one of the heads one of the folks who works there, posted insight in the making of the game via Twitter following an in-depth um, report by Bloomberg, which among other things claimed the E328 demo was almost entirely fake according to an anonymous member of the development team. The site sorts, um, the site's um, source claimed that un that the underlying gameplay system has not been coded or even finalized by the time Cyberpunk 2077 was shown behind closed door to press, press and other industry professionals in June 2018, which is why it included features missing from the final game. The developer said it w the developer said it was a waste of months that should have gone towards making the game. Um, the person as Adam. Um, tweeted a statement addressing three claims for the article, starting with the accusation that the demo was fake. One of the comments he made said, quote, It is hard for a trade show um, game demo not to be a test of vision or vertical slice two years before the game shipped, but that doesn't mean it's fake, he wrote. Games are not made in a linear fashion and start look and start looking like the final product only a few months before launch. Launch though. If you look at the demo now, it's different, yes, but that's what the work in progress watermark is for. Our final game looks and plays way better than what the demo ever was. He added that missing features are part of the um, create creation project progress. <clears throat> excuse me, process with some drop with some drop based on whether they worked as part of the final product. He also disputed that Cyberpunk 2077's launch was a disaster, as the article suggests pointing to the clearly claim um, achievement on PC. Um, as for the old um, as for the old gen consoles, yes, that is another case, but we've owned up to that and are working super hard to eliminate bugs on PC2. We know that's not a perfect version either, and we are proud um, of Cyberpunk 2077 as a game and artistic vision. Bloomberg noted that CD Projekt Red um, declined to comment or participate in the feature before publication, though. So, if I had to lean, if I had to choose who I would lean, who I believed on this, though, I would say, honestly, I would lean a little bit more towards Jason Stryer of Bloomberg, former of Kotaku, than I would with CD Projekt Red, considering. Um, a lot of, considering a lot of the dramas we saw with Anthem, how he exposed a lot of this, that, of that, I would say I would lean a little bit more towards him, though. I mean, yes, they said that the game was not a final, that this game was not the final, final version of all that stuff, but when you look at the final version that we got at the time before all these patches had come out, yeah, I can see why some people feel like this was, they were misled or lied to and all that stuff, and CD Projekt Red, really hurted themselves on this. They really 
hurted their reputations on this very uh, on this game really bad. I mean, yes, it looks like the game certainly did well, but it certainly has a certainly has a sore a black black eye because of the whole the lies, the constant delays and all that stuff, and the fact that it ran in a piss poor state, particularly on the PS4 and the Xbox One and all that stuff. And this has sort of made some people concerns about, you know, the upcoming Resident Evil 8 Village that they're releasing. They're also going to bring it to the PS4 and Xbox One. And many are concerned it will be the Cyberpunk 2077 situation all over again and all. And yeah, so I, I can see why a lot of gamers would be... Um, a bit upset and it is very misleading if it if the report is true which i said i'm leaning a little bit towards being true and all that stuff if the demo we had was not was fake and all that stuff i mean compare that to say and i know some may think i'm going a little bit overboard but compare that to say like a game like hyrule warriors when that was released on the wii u we saw the game um from what we saw the game improved over time and all that all that stuff until it reached you know the final product because nintendo does have a history i'm not saying they're perfect i'm not saying everything they do is 100 percent right all the time but they have a good history of quality value and content though in terms of with their games and you see their games sort of improve over improve during development until you see like the final product and all that stuff it's one of the reasons why i have uh, so I have more respect for them than I would say for a company like, say, EA or Activision, given their history and all that stuff. So it, it's just really, just really sad that this just adds more and more to the whole Cyberpunk 2077 controversy. And like I said before, CD Projekt Red has their work cut out for them. So overall, I would say... Um, um, CD Projekt Red could deny this if they want to, but given Jason Schreier's history of really, you know, reporting on a lot of this and pointing out a lot of the dramas we've seen before, especially like as, as I mentioned, Anthem, I'm more leaning towards I'm believing this story in terms of the fact that the demo that they showed was actually fake and that, it, it, or like, you know, in the kind of situation we saw with Watch Dogs and it's somewhat in the situation like Watch Dogs where basically we seen a better version. The fact that the demo looks way better than the final version, yeah. It's kind of like, that's where I'm seeing with Cyberpunk 2077 to a certain, to a certain degree. It's kind of like what we saw with Watch Dogs and all. And that's really, really sad though, because I mean, I've been playing this game on Stadia and it's not a bad game or anything like that. I just wish, it's just unfortunate that it's being marred in the controversy. A lot of it is of CD Projekt Red's um, doing and all. <clears throat> okay, uh, we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we'll get to our fifth and final part. And this one has to do with the Resident Evil showcase that Capcom did. And some information about Resident Evil, you know, 8 or Resident Evil Village. So we'll take a quick break and we will be right back. Okay, and we are back with our fifth and final part of our My True Scent video for this week. And for this one, I'm going to be taking a look at what was shown at the Resident Evil Showcase. So one of the big announcements for this year, though, we're going to be getting is basically um, Resident Evil 8. Now, some of the footage that they have shown um, before, or at least some of the stuff we, or some of the trailers they showed at this point, showed off some of the locations, such as like this village and all that stuff. And my first expression, my first opinion on it though, was that it definitely looked like we're getting somewhat of a Resident Evil 4 vibe out of it, which certainly wasn't, isn't necessarily a bad thing, as I consider Resident Evil 4 one of my favorite entries in the Resident Evil series and all that stuff. Well, recently, um, Capcom did have a Resident Evil showcase, and they showed off um, mostly about Resident Evil 8, but we also heard stuff about the multiplayer Resident Evil and the Resident Evil Netflix, though. So, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to watch it. Some stuff popped up, but I sort of read some of the information that comes out, and it certainly has put a smile on my face, even though technically they didn't show the, even though we didn't hear about the rumor 
Resident Evil Th Revelation 3 or the Switch Focus Resident Evil. That would have been nice though, but at least what they show definitely is a positive sign and all that. Um, in one of the articles, the first one from IGN, they talked about basically what they showed off on basically for Resident Evil. One of them was the story trailer, which has basically often referred to um, basically what they refer to as this woman basically known as like the um, vampire or something like that though. But And they also showed off some of the gameplay and obviously the gameplay is taking an approach similar to what Resident Evil 7 is, although they now show that you could basically um, block and all that stuff to the whole merchandise, the merchant and all like from the Resident Evil 4. So to me, based on what they showed so far, it looked like a mixture of Resident Evil 7 and Resident Evil 4. And that certainly isn't a bad thing. On top of that, I'm also getting a little bit of that Bloodborne and Dark Souls um, vibe out of it, which again, isn't also, isn't necessarily a bad thing at all. Two things I do want to point out that they showed off from the gameplay and even the trailer. One, the sisters that basically, you know, turn into moths and fly around and basically look like they attack you with looks like a hook or something like like that. Um, I know I know the I know it's named something else, but I just don't know what the name is. I don't know how to say the name correctly, so I apologize for that. That kind of reminded me a little bit of that shadowy figure from an early version of Resident Evil 4. I think this was back in 2003 when they showed off what looked like um, Leon walking through a hallways and you saw this shadowy figure with a hook coming up to Leon and attacking him and all. To one of the snapshots that they showed off, at least in this article, looks very similar um, to the kind of symbol we saw when, you know, the original Resident Evil, you know, the evil Umbrella Corporation and all. So I'm a little bit curious to see if Umbrella in some form, in some capacity, is going to um, be in this game or anything like that. So it's def, I will say that's definitely interesting. Plus the fact that they are bringing back, you know, the suitcase, you know, the suitcase or the storage um, storage uh, storage approach that they did with Resident Evil 4 is a plus. I like that approach better than the whole item box thing. I wasn't really a big fan of the item box approach. Not saying that it's completely bad, but I just don't agree with that approach compared to how they how Resident Evil 4 was done. So, a lot of the gameplay that they showed so far has definitely um, put a smile on my face i'm looking and i'm definitely looking forward to trying this one out they do have a de demo called the maiden but unfortunately it's only available for those who are only available for the ps5 which um, unfortunately as of right now it is um very um difficult to get a ps5 at this moment um one thing it is pointed out though is that supposedly the game will also be coming to the ps4 and the xbox one though and supposedly there are reports that it will also support smart delivery which if that assuming that is true if that's true which sounds like it is that certainly is a nice thing um indeed other things that they showed off of course was the multiplayer um called resident evil reverser if I'm saying the name correctly, Joe, it says that, quote, um, Cap um, announced that Resident Evil Versa and a multiplayer experience will be free to anybody who purchased um, Village and all that stuff. Um, we'll have a beta test for Resident Evil Ambassadors soon and all that stuff. Um, they show off some of the screenshots and they had some of the characters from Resident Evil 7 to basically, um, you know, Nemesis, um, Tyrant. They also showed up Claire, Hulk. I don't know why they haven't done a Resident Evil game starring Hulk. I think he would be a perfect choice for that, to do a Resident Evil game for him, with him, though. To, you know, Jill, Leon, so a bunch of other stuff, though. This is basically mostly just a multiplayer-style game. Um, it doesn't really click with me as much, though, as compared to Resident Evil 8. I mean, if you're into multiplayer, fine. This, is, this could be right up your alley, but to me... I'm more excited about Resident Evil 8 than the multiplayer Resident Evil that they're doing. And they also announced they're doing a crossover with The Division 2 where you can have your characters um, received um, basically the Re Leon Kennedy um, outfit or Resident Evil themed outfits. I mean, great if you're a fan of Division, Division 2. 
not really up my alley and all that stuff. And finally, they talked about, you know, the movie tease for Resident Evil. Um, you know, the Netflix movie tease, and not to mention the TV show and all that stuff. The article reads that, quote, Resident Evil has long standed beyond games and there's plenty of other projects in the pipeline. Capcom teased that one, one of those during the showcase, the previous announced Resident Evil um, animated uh, movie in Infinite Darkness. Not much is known, but we did. they did point out some footage of the film, which is set to hit the streaming service sometime in 2021. And Capcom's also working on a Resident Evil TV series with Netflix, which tells a brand new story in the universe. So obviously a lot of Resident Evil stuff out there, but the highlight for me uh, is basically Resident Evil Village, Resident Evil 8. And like I said, for what I've been seeing so far, it looks really impressive and I'm looking forward to that game when it comes out and all. And while that's all great and all, unfortunately, one of the games that have been rumored for quite some time, which is basically a Resident Evil a remake of Resident Evil 4, um, basically um, could it basically uh, is hitting some snags. And according to an article from GameSpot, it reads that, quote, Resident Evil 4 Remake delay due to development overhaul, though. Uh, the article reads that the rumored Resident Evil, 4, Resident Evil 4 Remake might be further away than initially suspected, with a report st stating that Capcom is changing direction on a project and shaking up its development studio. The report by VGC, Video Game Chronicles, indicates that a, that a remake of Resident Evil 4 has been in development since 2018, following the foremost establishment by the remakes for both Resident Evil 2 and 3. The studio leading the project was M2, a studio founded by Platinum Games, uh, a studio founded by one of the employees at Platinum Games. The studio most recently contributed to the development of Resident Evil 3 Remake, some people liked it, some people didn't. There are things some people liked about that game, and of course, not every, and some people didn't exactly like about it. Anyway, continuing on though, it says, quote, Capcom has reportedly shifted course after a key project uh, review in late 2020 where the director, Direction M2 was taken with the remake was questioned. It seemed the studio wants to follow the template of Resident Evil 4 more closely this time, considering the backlash Resident Evil 3 remake incurred for cutting content from the original. Um, Capcom and specifically its Division 1 studio wanted to keep the game wanted to keep the game overall direction but experiment with new features and mechanics like how Resident Evil 2 re reworked the inclusion of Mixer X to great effect. As a result, Capcom's Division 1 will now be leading the project, with M2 involvement reportedly reducing s significantly. This also means the game will likely not be ready for quite some time, with the report mentioned that its latest window is 2023, a year after it was rumored to launch. So, assuming this is true and all that stuff, it is somewhat uh, disappointing to hear that it looks like Resident Evil 4 will not be, or the remake of Resident Evil 4 will not be released. Uh, we'll have, we're going to have to wait a little bit more and all that. And it is kind of a fortunate, unfortunate considering how not everyone was a fan of the Resident Evil 3 remake though. I don't think that remake was necessarily bad. It it brought some of the stuff that people liked about re the Resident Evil 2 remake, which is good. But at the same time, I felt like there were stuff, it didn't reach the level of Resident Evil 2 Remake though. It didn't have the choices you can make like the original Resident Evil um, 3 did. And the way Nemesis was approached, mixed at best. On one hand though, you didn't have to worry about him stalking you all over the place like um, Tyrus did in the Resident Evil 2 Remake. But on the other hand though, a lot of people were hoping to see something similar to what Tyrus was in the Resident Evil 2 Remake and that kind of may have disappointed um, some folks. So, assuming this is true and all that stuff, it is a little bit unfortunate though and that we're going to have to wait a little bit longer. Hopefully the wait isn't that long though. Although personally, if they were going to remake any more Resident Evil games, I think they should remake um, Code Veronica. I mean, you already remake 2 and 3. Why not Code Veronica? I think that one um, deserves a remake though. So overall, very impressed with Resident Evil 8, um, what they showed so far or, or what I've read. Um, definitely getting a Resident Evil for Bloodborne and Dark Souls vibes out of it, which is certainly a good thing and all. 
I'm not big on the multiplayer part. Some people will like it, some people won't. Um, the Netflix show I might take a look at. And assuming these rumors are true, though, about Resident Evil 4 um, development trouble, though, um, it is somewhat disappointing. But hopefully, we do see the game, and hopefully, it turns out. Um, hopefully, it turns out to be good and all that stuff. So, overall, I will say the showcase-wise, what I've read. Um, obviously fo focused on Resident Evil Village, which certainly isn't necessarily a bad thing, and it's definitely definitely one of the games I'm definitely looking forward to um, this year. <clears throat> okay, um, this concludes this um, My Two Cent video for this week, and again, these are my opinion. What are yours? What are your thoughts about I Ichigata, if I'm saying his name correctly, um, starting his own game development studio? Are you looking forward to whatever games he's going to put out and all that stuff? Um, are you disappointed that they're not going to do a Devil's Third or you don't really care? Do you think he should um, work with Microsoft? And do you think it's possible we could see Microsoft um, buy his studio or anything like that? What are your thoughts about the New York Times report about, you know, kids being, you know, addicted to video games during the pandemic or anything like that. Do you think they have a good point to what they're making in the article? Or do you see them kind of blowing it maybe way out of proportion or anything like that? What are your, <clears throat> excuse me, what are your thoughts about Kingdom of Amler re-reckoning coming to the Nintendo Switch? Are you looking forward to this game coming to the Nintendo Switch? Are you excited that they are bringing this game to, to the Nintendo Switch? Um, or are you happy with the version that's already available, whether it's on the PS4, the Xbox One, or PC and all? What are your thoughts about this report about Cyberpunk 2077 that the demo may have been um, fake though? Do you think this just adds more to the controversy surrounding Cyberpunk 2077 and CD Projekt Red? Or do you think people are maybe blowing it way out of proportion though? And what are your thoughts about the Resident Evil showcase, particularly with the Resident Evil Village that they showed? Are you excited for that game? Are you looking forward to picking that game up, though? Are you planning to pick it up for the PS5 or the Xbox Series S and X or, P or PC or the PS4 or Xbox One? Are you planning to try out the demo um, Maiden in at all? Do you are you going to look forward to the Resident Evil multiplayer game um, or the upcoming Netflix shows uh, and movies that's going to be coming out? Um, and do you think that are you worried about with the rumors going around about with the development trouble with the Resident Evil 4 remake? Or do you have faith that they will that they will be able to deliver a true remake of Resident Evil 4? Do you agree with what I said in this video? Do you disagree? Do you have a difference of opinion? Um, as always, sound off in the comment section below. Let me know what you think. And if you like this video, I hope you hit the like button. I would appreciate it. And I do hope you subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you do, make sure you hit the bell icon for notifications of any new videos I put up. Also, feel free to share this video if you want to. And feel free to donate to my channel if you like. You could do it through PayPal Me or Patreon. Links will be in the description of this video. And I will see you again next time when I do another video. Hopefully that will be soon. Until then, from Southern California, I wish you all a um, good day then. Bye!